Our moderator and uh, probably doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he's, uh, he's, this is not, definitely not his first rodeo. Uh, Jim Crisp. Uh, and I'll take a moment to tell you a couple of things about Jim. Jim is a professor of history at North Carolina State University. His book, Sleuthing the Alamo, Davy Crockett's Last Stand, and Other Mysteries of, Texas, of the Texas Revolution, uh, was the winner of the uh, Fehrenbach Award uh, in uh, 2005. Uh, he has also uh, uh, written uh, from the uh, Texas a and University Press, How Did Davy Die and Why Did We Care So Much? He wrote that in 2010, the same year that he was inducted uh, as a fellow in the Texas State Historical Association. Uh, he has an article, and I'm going to let him talk about that uh, for a moment. Uh, it's uh, depicted uh, as being in, uh, in a magazine uh, that is uh, out, but uh, it is not, in fact, in the... Uh, uh, the magazine that we're talking about, but uh, he will tell you uh, how to find that article. So without any further ado, uh, let me introduce Jim Crisp. <laughs> and this is RV, you don't have to point it anything. Uh, you'll need to give that to Gene. What's that? To, you need to give that to Gene if it's gonna. Oh, I'll just leave it up here. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. And uh, David is one of those people who works like a Trojan, as my father used to say, on, uh, on getting this thing going every year. And uh, we literally couldn't do it uh, without him. Uh, the magazine that David referred to just a moment ago, the article, uh, is uh, uh, there is an error in your program for which I am completely responsible. Uh, the copy of Houston History Magazine that you'll find in your packet uh, is, a, is a wonderful issue. It is not, however, the one uh, which has just come out uh, which has for the first time ever the color reproduction of Henry McArdle's painting of the Battle of San Jacinto that was done in 1901. It's a smaller version uh, of the one that hangs in the Texas uh, State Senate Chamber, and it was commissioned in 1901 by James DeShields at the same time that he commissioned the, the painting of David Crockett at the Alamo that hangs in the governor's mansion today. They were meant to be twins. One, the moment of greatest valor at the Alamo, the other, the moment of the greatest valor uh, at, at San Jacinto. Uh, that painting disappeared for 80 years, and it was only rediscovered in 2010. And the article that I've done recently, which has that new reproduction, is in the new issue of Houston History. Now, you need to go support the Center for Public History here at the University of Houston. Debbie Harwell, the, my editor there, and uh, the editor of the magazine has been extremely generous uh, in providing this copy of Houston History, now a, a, an award-winning publication recognized by the mayor's office here in Houston uh, last year. It is a, it's a really fine uh, uh, magazine. Uh, I chose it not only because of the local interest in San Jacinto, but also because they're able to do these great full-color reproductions. And uh, there's a long story behind that uh, full-color reproduction. Uh, yeah, that you'll see in this magazine, but uh, yeah, I, I really, they've got a whole box of those, this new issue of Houston History, and I urge you to go to their desk, to their booth uh, out in the lobby, and, and uh, if you're at all interested in San Jacinto, uh, get a copy of, uh, of that new issue of Houston History magazine. Uh, David has already thanked most of the people that I uh, wanted to thank. It, it would be... Uh, I would be remiss if I, uh, if I didn't mention Barbara Eves, who uh, was so helpful in organizing uh, the generous uh, reception for the patrons and the speakers held last night at the offices of Frank Holcomb, where many of us saw maps that we didn't even know existed, much less hadn't seen them in, uh, in person, maps of the United States and Texas in the, in the 15th through 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and um, the usual suspects, uh, are those that I would thank, Jan DeVault, Jeff Dunn, and uh, Dave Singleton, and all the other people who, who make my job uh, so easy. I just sort of walk up here, and they've done all the work all year long. Today's symposium is inspired by the shape of Texas, uh, or as the sign says, how the hell did Texas get in the shape it's in now? Uh, we're actually looking at the literal shape of Texas, the boundaries uh, of Texas, and uh, 
we're going to examine the historical forces and the actors uh, that drew these lines and gave them relative permanence. Uh, historians don't like to talk about permanence because we see all these historical maps and realize that the lines drawn once upon a time are not the same lines that are there. We don't like to think about what might happen if the lines we're familiar with get changed someday, uh, but they will eventually, sometime. Um, and people will look at historical maps of the world we lived in and think, how quaint. These lines have consequences, not only causes that we're going to be looking at today, but also consequences for both good and ill. Uh, what is it that borders represent? Uh, according to Benedict Anderson, the historian of nationalism, um, these maps and boundaries are often, uh, often represent projections of what he called imagined communities. In any modern nation state today, most of the people don't know most of their fellow citizens and that they feel a part of a fraternity of nationalism. Most Texans don't know all the other Texans, but they feel a part of this community. And over the last 200 years, as nations have taken shape, certain images, certain symbols, flags for one, but also maps, have become very important in projecting, uh, not reality necessarily, but aspiration, uh, boundaries, not only represent uh, boundaries drawn on a map, usually represent aspirations more than realities, especially in the early years when you have competing boundaries and competing aspirations, as happened in this part of the world around the time of San Jacinto uh, and the Texas Revolution. These aspirations, of course, that represented hopes rather than realities, were true for the northern Mexican frontier just as much as they were true for the frontiers of the Republic of Texas. Both Mexico and Texas claimed areas they could not control. As I told the Houston Chronicle the other day, if you wanted to go directly from San Antonio to Santa Fe, you'd better be a Comanche uh, because those were the only people who could go directly from San Antonio to Santa Fe no matter whether that was considered the Republic of Texas or the Republic of Mexico. It was the lords of the Southern Plains who decided who would take that trip uh, from San Antonio to Santa Fe. So sometimes lines drawn on a map uh, are, are misleading. Uh, those people that the late David Weber called Indios Barbaros, uh, those barbarians were the ones who often, uh, uh, whether their lines were drawn on the map or not, uh, control that area, and as we know now from the work of Pekka Hamalainen and, and uh, Brian DeLay and other historians, recent historians of the Comanche, that was the expanding empire in the Southern Plains in the 18th and 19th century until they, uh, uh, until they were finally vanquished uh, militarily in the 1860s and 70s. It was a long, long, bloody war. Uh, and I'd like to give just a uh, unsolicited testimonial to the new book that I'm reading right now called The Searchers, which is one of the most penetrating and well-written uh, stories of Cynthia Ann Parker and her son, Quana, uh, that I've seen. And I uh, haven't finished the book, but what I've read so far is just absolutely marvelous. Uh, next year, we hope to do uh, a history of the Texas Revolution and the period before and after, uh, with emphasis on the Tejanos. Uh, I hope someday we can do a symposium that focuses on uh, Native Americans and what was going on in Texas during this period uh, from their perspective. Today for us, uh, the boundaries of Texas are going to be a window onto history. Uh, they represent forces and actors uh, that created these boundaries. Um, whenever you see straight lines on a map, be very suspicious. Uh, straight lines drawn on a map means that somebody at a distance drew those lines. If you look at a map of Europe today, how many straight lines do you see? None. 
That's because those boundaries were hammered out by the people on the scene in wars and treaties that determined those boundaries. But it was, it was people in London that drew those straight lines separating North Carolina and Virginia, or Pennsylvania and Maryland. And then once you get out to the American West, you see these rectangles and squares, meaning that the people on the scene did not draw those lines. Those boundaries were imposed by a power that could even be called imperial, whether that's the British Empire or the growing American empire spreading across the American West uh, in the 19th century. Um, we're going to hear from four speakers today uh, who have uh, studied these forces and these actors which created the boundaries and then who had to live with those boundaries. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes fighting and, and contesting those boundaries. Uh, our, our first speaker today, who is going to handle the northern and eastern uh, boundaries of Texas, the Red River and the Sabine River in particular, uh, is Gene Allen Smith. Gene, as you'll see, is professor of history at TCU, received his doctorate at Auburn, uh, Gene is one of the busiest men in show business. Uh, he uh, he uh, will uh, leave Texas next year, actually, to become a distinguished professor of naval heritage at the United States Naval Academy in, uh, in Annapolis. He has been for many years one of the chief uh, historians of the early expansion of the United States, and that's what brings him into collision uh, with the Adams on East Treaty of 1819 and the boundaries that were being set for Texas in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, one of the books that's most pertinent uh, to this is a book he did in the late 90s, Filibusterers and Expansionists, uh, Jeffersonian Manis Manifest Destiny, 1800 to 1821. Uh, it's during that period that, the, uh, that the, the, the boundary between the United States and uh, and, and New Spain was being hammered out and decided uh, by treaty. Uh, Gene is also the director of the Center for Texas Studies at TCU, the curator of, the, of history for the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, which I just got to visit for the first time this year, uh, a marvelous facility. Uh, and um, if I were to list all of Gene's uh, edited and written books and all of his articles, I would cut deeply into his time. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Professor Gene Allen Smith. Maybe. Can you hear me now? OK. There we go. Last summer, the end of last summer, when That'd be great. Yeah, I'm kind of blind anyways. Uh, last summer when Jim called me and asked me if I'd be willing to come and talk at the symposium, I told him, certainly I'd love to come, but you need to know I'm not what I'd really call a Texas historian. You know, I don't deal with the Texas Revolution per se, and I don't deal with the cattle, ray, uh, the cattle drives, and I don't deal with oil wells, and I tend to deal with an earlier period when Texas was not quite so determined. And so I, he assured me that that would be sufficient, even though I'm not really a Texas historian. So I told him I'd, I'd be happy to come. And then when I started looking at my calendar, I said, oh my gosh, do you guys know what today is? April 13th? 270 years ago, Thomas Jefferson's birthday. <laughs> and I thought, how appropriate, because I'm going to spend a little time talking about Thomas Jefferson today and kind of tie Jefferson to Texas when, where a lot of historians do not. Now, you know, when we talk about Jefferson, we generally do not assume that he is associated with Texas, but we know Historians who have studied Jefferson and who've studied expansion, we know that Jefferson does have a connection. 
He wrote about Tejas, and he saw Tejas as being a part of the United States. And in fact, it's his vision, his vision for what he would call an empire of liberty, an empire of liberty. That would be his vision for America. And it's a very simple concept. He wanted an empire that had abundant land where everybody could have their own little farm, white picket fenced house, two car garage, a Land Rover and a Beamer. I mean, that's his vision of what America would become. Because if everyone had land, they were bought into this new experiment. And that's the period I work in, the early republic, in which the United States was still an experiment. No one was quite sure if it was going to survive. But Jefferson, he knew that as long as you could acquire more land and build this empire of liberty, that that experiment would survive and it would prosper. So Jefferson is truly involved in this idea of expansion. He's truly involved in this quest for Texas. I mean, Jefferson had a vision of what America could become. And I'll give you an example. When he was serving as Secretary of State in the early 1790s, the governor of East Florida invited Americans, invited Americans to come settle in, in Florida, East Florida. Now, Jefferson wrote to the president, he said, he wished 100,000 Americans would make that trek to Florida because he said it will give us peaceably what might otherwise cost us a war. Well, that is Jefferson's idea of how the United States would acquire land. It's a, it's a simple process. You have someone invite Americans in, they bring their families and they bring their, their home goods and they establish homesteads. And after a period of time, they become discontented with local rule. They want to throw off the yoke of oppression and they want to become American again. So if Jefferson said 100,000 would bring us peaceably what might otherwise cost us a war, that's the method by which that would occur. Now, in his first inaugural address in 1801, Jefferson claimed that his country was a chosen country with enough room for our descendants to the hundred and thousandth generation. Yet, in 1801, his country was not, his country was not big enough for a hundred and thousandth generation. I mean, think about it. His country was surrounded in 1801. To the north there is Canada that is controlled by the British. To the south there is Florida that is controlled by the Spanish. And to the west there is Louisiana and the Trans-Mississippi West that is controlled by the Spanish. And then by the early part of the 19th century will be transferred to France and Napoleon. And that creates all kinds of difficulties. Jefferson knew that as long as foreign power bordered the United States, then that threatened the United States. And it threatened the security of the country. He knew that that had to be removed. The United States had to have enough land for the future. Now, shortly after the War of 1812, Jefferson would claim, he would write to his friend John Jacob Astor, that he looked forward with gratification to a time when the entirety of the Pacific coast of North America would be populated with free and independent Americans. Now, so Jefferson is envisioning not just a continental nation. He's envisioning a nation that will stretch all across the Western Hemisphere. Shortly after his inauguration in 1801, he had said that it's not impossible to look forward to distant times when our rapid multiplication will expand itself and cover the whole northern, if not southern, continents. I mean, think about this. Jefferson is thinking about an entire western hemisphere that is a republic of small farmers. That would create his empire of liberty that he envisioned. 
And the only way to ensure that that empire would prosper and thrive was to remove the obstacles, be it the Native Americans in the West, the British in the North, the Spanish in the South. And as president, we see how he begins to incorporate this, this new republic. In 1803, Ohio becomes the 17th state, joining the original 13 and then Tennessee, Kentucky, and Vermont. The same year, Indiana became a territory with William Henry Harrison being appointed governor. And of course, what happens by the end of 1803? The Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson is interested in expansion. He sees expansion as being the panacea for all the nation's problems. And as long as there was land to the west, Jefferson knew that, there, that Americans could follow the setting sun. That's really the story of America, people following the setting sun. On December 20th, 1803, General James Wilkinson took possession of Louisiana, which is the Orleans Territory, and about three months later in mid-March, Amos Stoddard, Captain, Captain Amos Stoddard, took possession of St. Louis. That was the Louisiana Territory. And with that, the United States had acquired, by chance, Jefferson's greatest achievement as president the Louisiana Territory, acquired for about three cents an acre. I mean, you could not, could not have provided a, a better opportunity. Now, with the acquisition of this land, Jefferson says there's enough land for the hundredth and thousandth generation. Now, Jefferson is pretty precise about everything. He calculates that a generation is 30 years. Okay, let's do the math here. I'm not real good. I'm a historian here. But the 30th generation, 30 times uh, 100th generation times 30 is what, 3,000? And then the 1,000th generation is 30,000? So he says there'll be enough land for a minimum of 3,000 and potentially as much as 30,000 years. He kind of missed the boat on that one, didn't he? Yeah, it, we... I mean, certainly Western historians would tell you that by 1890, the frontier has vanished and there's no longer this, this uh, vision of what Jefferson had, in, had seen for America. Now, one of the interesting things about that purchase is that when the United States acquired Louisiana, it did acquire a territory with uncertain and unclear Western boundaries. The Maurice de Talleyrand, the foreign minister who had sold this along with Napoleon, had left those western boundaries intentionally vague, basically telling the American ministers, Robert Livingston and Jane Monroe, yeah, yeah, there's land out to the west, yeah, you, you buy that too. But what did it encompass? No one knew. But as soon as the United States pos takes possession of it, Jefferson is already beginning to envision where that western boundary lies. And he is convinced that that western boundary lies south at the Rio Grande. So it would include all of what is present day Texas. That was to be his empire of liberty. Yet, we know that the the purchase only momentarily satisfies Americans. And I want to bring to your attention an episode that would happen beginning in 1810. Now this is a couple of years before the, the beginning of the War of 1812. Americans are beginning to move to the west. They're crossing the Mississippi River. They're settling in the present day state of Missouri. And then south along the river in a little place called Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge was a Spanish possession. And in September of 1810, a group of Americans who had moved into that region of Baton Rouge 
Many of them had lived there as much as 10 years. They had become dissatisfied with Spanish rule, and they decided that it was time to throw off the yoke of Spanish oppression. In September 1810, they stormed the dilapidated Spanish fort there at Baton Rouge. They captured the governor of West Florida. And during this attack, one Spanish soldier was killed. But this is the beginning of what historians often refer to as the West Florida Rebellion. And I always, I love monikers, you know, when we give titles to things. When we say rebellion, that's generally an implication of what? That it doesn't succeed. You know, we, do we call it the American Rebellion? No, we call it the American Revolution. You know, the American Revolution has been successful. The, do we call it the Texas Rebellion? No, we call it the Texas Revolution. Well, here, this is generally named the West Florida Rebellion with the implication that it doesn't succeed. Well, what happens is when they stormed that fort, they took the governor prisoner and they called a convention where they drafted a declaration and a constitution that looks eerily similar to the U.S. Constitution, and then they asked for annexation into the United States. And about a month and a half later, President James Madison says, yeah, we, we're incorporating this section as a part of the old Louisiana Purchase, not as a free and independent republic, but for a month and a half, the Republic of West Florida, the Republic of West Florida, even had its own flag. You know, I hate to say this. Some people say it's the original Lone Star Republic. Over in Louisiana, they say that. The original Lone Star, yeah. But Madison is able to incorporate this into the United States, not as a free and independent republic, but as part of the, the Louisiana Purchase. And at the same time this event is happening in Baton Rouge, there's also a series of other events. In fact, you may know of Father Miguel Hidalgo, who initiates a, a rebellion in Mexico, beginning in September of 10 in Dolores. And by the end of the year, there were revolutions springing up in Guanajuato and Guadalajara and New Santander and Cuilla, even in San Antonio. It appeared that this Hidalgo revolt was going to change the face of Mexico <laughs> and potentially of Texas. But by July 1811, Hidalgo had been captured and executed and the rebellion brutally suppressed. Now, one of those followers of Hidalgo was a young man named Jose Bernardo Maximilian Gutierrez de Lala. That's a mouthful. And he had fled Mexico, uh, fled, pardon me, fled Texas when the rebellion had failed. He eventually made his way to Washington, D.C., where he got a meeting with Secretary of State James Monroe. And Monroe introduced him to a Cuban revolutionary by the name of Don Jose Alvarez Toledo y Dubois. He had a French mother. Uh, and a U.S. Army officer who resigned his commission by the name of Augustus William McGee. And according to Monroe's journals and his papers, he simply introduced these men. What happened beyond that, he could not, he could not tell. Well, we know that these men make their way back to Louisiana. They begin raising a group of filibusters in Natchitoches. And in August of 1812, they cross over the neutral ground and advance on Nacogdoches. Their Spanish forces will quickly surrender and join the movement, the filibuster, we often refer to it as the Gutierrez Revolt. 
from Nagadoches, they travel south to La Bahia. And after a four month siege, they take La Bahia, then move to the west and advance on San Antonio. And the capture of San Antonio seemed to bring about the success of this revolt. Perhaps this too would be a revolution in the making. But apparently with the capture of San Antonio, the, the forces chose to execute the governor, Manuel, the Spanish governor, Manuel Salcedo. And that alienated many of the Americans who saw this not as a war of retribution, but instead as a, a revolution to bring liberty and to create a, a republic that perhaps would join with the, the American Republic. So the Americans walked out. And within months, this rebellion was going to crumble. But what had happened here was that this western boundary of the Louisiana Purchase was fluid in motion. Yes, you might draw boundaries in a faraway court, but there was no guarantee that on the ground those boundaries were going to remain firm. In fact, in the months and years after the War of 1812, there would be other movements to try to separate Texas from, from, the, from the Spanish. Jean Lafitte and his group of privateers, or what some people might call pirates. They had relocated their operation from the coast of Louisiana west to the area of Galveston. And working with a, a South American privateer named Michel Ari, a Frenchman, they created a privateering base there at Galveston that was wreaking havoc on Spanish trade in the Caribbean. There was also a group of former Napoleonic officers who tried to establish a colony on the lower reaches of the Trinity at Les Chans de Zille. They claimed they wanted to create a haven, a place for the emperor to build a new empire. Well, Lafitte and his, his band of happy followers end up reporting to the Spanish where these men were, and the French settlement there just collapses. And of course, you probably know of James Long and his expedition. The reason I'm telling you about these things is to show you how flux, how much change there was in this borderland. And this is at the same time, the same time that... Um, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams is negotiating for the, the acquisition of new territory. Now, the, the adams onise Treaty, also referred to as the Transcontinental Treaty, it would be negotiated between John Quincy Adams and the Spanish Minister of the United States, Don Luis Onise, in February 1819. Then, for the next two years, the Spanish government stalled on the ratification. In fact, the reason they stalled is they hoped that the United, by stalling, that the United States would try to curtail privateering against the Spanish Empire in the Western Hemisphere. During that two years of stalling, the question of Florida and the West came before the U.S. Congress, and there were a group of Western and Southern congressmen, people like Henry Clay, who began clamoring for the annexation of Texas in this, the inclusion of Texas in this Western boundary. They weren't successful in getting Texas included. In fact, when the treaty is finally signed, or ratified, I should say, in February of 1821, almost two years to the date, 
What this treaty provided for was, and it's often misrepresented, it said that the United States would pay $5 million, up to $5 million, and in return would secure the Florida Peninsula. Now that is not saying that the United States bought Florida from Spain. In fact, that money was to be paid into claims that American farmers had against the Spanish government. For years, there had been Indian raids, maroon raids from Florida across the border to Southern American farms in places like Georgia, the Mississippi Territory, Alabama. And they were claims, these farmers had filed claims against the Spanish government. So the United States would pay those claims and in return would secure Florida. That's what Monroe had wanted. That's what Jefferson had wanted since 1791. If you looked at Florida, think of Florida as a pistol with the, the long peninsula part as the handle and the panhandle as the barrel and the barrel pointed directly to the Mississippi River. Whoever controlled that, pan uh, that panhandle could in effect control the river. And the river is the main outlet for American growth and expansion. So John Quincy Adams had negotiated and secured the Florida Peninsula. In return, he gave up, he gave up a western boundary for the Louisiana Purchase. And that boundary is very simple. Informally, it's called the step boundary that very simply went from the Sabine River north from the Gulf of Mexico to the 32nd parallel south pardon me, 32nd parallel north, then due north to the Red River, west along the Red River to the 100th meridian west, due north to the Arkansas River, west to its headwaters, north to the 42nd parallel north, and finally, west along this parallel to the Pacific Ocean. That's my effort at freehand. So you can see what we talk about this stair-stepped fashion. And by creating that western boundary, pundits and historians alike have claimed that John Quincy Adams sold Texas out that he gave up Texas. In return, what did he secure? Very simply, he secured an unquestioned claim to the Pacific coast of North America. So does John Quincy Adams' decision limit the growth of America? Did it curtail the adams onis Treaty? No, it does not. In fact, What's going to happen is that John Quincy Adams knew exactly what was happening there on the ground. He is Secretary of State. He knows of the, the role of Lafitte, the filibusters, Long. He knows what's happening. And more importantly, he knows of, even though he secured that peace on the Pacific coast, He knows of the efforts of this guy here, probably a guy you've never heard of. His name is Arsène Le Carrier Latour. He's a Frenchman. He's fairly significant. He serves as Jackson's principal engineer at the Battle of New Orleans. So when you go to Chalmette and you see the line that Jackson fought along, it's thanks to, to, thanks to Latour. He chose the line at Rodrigue Canal. It was his idea to throw the ramparts up and put the, the cotton bells down into the mud to serve as firing platforms for the cannon. But after the battle, 
He, like all the other soldiers, were dismissed. He's unemployed. And he had been an architect and engineer for years. He had worked for the Spanish. He had worked for the French. He decided to sell his efforts to the Spanish. And he and John Lafitte would make an expedition. Publicly, they claimed they were going into the, the gold lands of Arkansas. Now, you may be snickering, but I know you can actually find gold there. There's state parks where you can go pan for gold. I've never found any, but I know that you can. At least they say you can. Now, publicly, he did go to that region, and they were seen, and there were comments about how Latour and Lafitte were in the area. But then surreptitiously, they began moving to the west, and they were following the Red River, the Sabine. They ultimately looked for the, the sources of the Red, the Sabine, the Trinidad, the Arkansas, and the Colorado River. And because Lafitte was an explorer, you know, he was simply along for what could be gained out of it. Latour was an engineer. He drew articulated maps. And he wrote a very lengthy report that he turned over to the Spanish in New Orleans. It was then sent to the Governor General of Cuba, the Viceroy of Mexico, and it trickled down to the, to the provincial governors. And in that report he said, and I want to read some parts of it to you. He says, the Americans aspire to supremacy over the future republics of the new world. And this desire is founded on national interests rather than the liberality of ideas and the happiness of mankind. He says the government works for this same end and the first author of this plan is Mr. Jefferson. More importantly, he said, that should Spain not do something, the time will come and unfortunately is not far off when the Americans will pour in myriads into Texas and to Mexico. In other words, he's telling the Spanish, you guys better put up a, a, a border fence. And if you don't put up a border fence, these Americans are just going to flood in. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> the Americans, he wrote, have strength of character, courage, skill in the use of their guns, and their eyes are fixed on Mexico like the Jews on the promised land. And they would join any expedition, even if it had little prospects of success, as they have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Well, that's the report that is circulated through Spanish archives, through Spanish bureaucratic channels. And also, James Monroe got a copy of it. And his Secretary of State, of course, John Quincy Adams, had had access to this report. So why does Adams give up Texas? He knows. He can gain that claim to the, the Northwest unquestionably, and he knows it's only a matter of time, only a matter of time before the Americans will seize. Think about what had happened in Baton Rouge. This is exactly the same thing. The idea that Americans move into an area they set up homesteads and villages and farms, and it's only a matter of time before they get tired of the foreign rule and they want to throw off the shackles of, of opposition or of oppression, and then they ask to be annexed into the Union. That's exactly what had happened there at Baton Rouge. So there is this desire for Texas. And as you guys well know, as we get into the early 1820s, there is a, 
a growing flood of Americans that begin moving into Texas. When Mexico gains its independence and initially begins inviting Americans in, people like Stephen F. Austin bring people in. And by 1824, there are 2,000 Americans living in Texas. By 1830, there are 20,000 Americans. By 1835, there are 30,000 Americans. And guess what happens? As more and more come, well, they begin clamoring for certain rights. Now, I need not say, but you know that John Wayne, Richard Widmark, Lawrence Harvey, you know, you got to go back to the original. <laughs> I was on a panel about a year ago with Steve Harden, and I mentioned this, and I could see him bristle about it. Uh, but the, the loss of the Alamo created that impetus, that incentive for revenge that would obviously be secured not far from here on April 21st. And when Antonio Lopez Santana is forced to sign the Treaty of Velasco, giving Texas its independence, creating a new Lone Star Republic, the new Lone Star Republic wanted to join the constellation of stars and stripes. And of course, that does not happen because of the issue of slavery and the debate in Congress. Andrew Jackson does recognize the Republic of Texas on his last day in office in 18, March 1837. His successor, Van Buren, doesn't touch the Texas question with a 10-foot pole. But in 1844, it becomes a campaign issue in which James Knox Polk is going to win election on a campaign of expansion. But shortly before he takes office, the former president, the lame duck president, you can say, John Tyler is able to push the annexation of Texas through Congress with a joint resolution of Congress rather than a, a treaty. The difference is a joint resolution called for a simple majority as opposed to a treaty that called for a two-thirds majority. And with Tyler's legislative victory and with Polk's electoral victory. It was only a matter of days before Texas became the 28th state of the Union. Once Texas entered in December of 1845, Jefferson's vision had been fulfilled. By the end of the 1840s, the American Empire or Empire of Liberty, as Jefferson would have called it, stretched all the way to the Pacific. And it was during the debates over that boundary line that it was claimed that John Quincy Adams had sold Texas out. Of course, that New Englander would sell out the South. He didn't. He knew what was happening. He knew it was a matter of time. And in the grand scheme of world affairs, a few years is only a drop in the bucket. In December 1845, as Texas was going to enter into the Union, New York newspaper editor John Lewis O'Sullivan wrote an editorial an editorial in which he claimed that the right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent which providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federative development 
of self-government entrusted to us. It is right such as that of the tree to the space of air and the earth suitable for the full expansion of its principle and destiny for growth. Jefferson's dreams, his vision, he'd been dead 20 years by now, but yet his vision had been fulfilled. The Transcontinental Treaty, or the adams onis Treaty, whichever you prefer to call it, it doesn't delay Texas's entrance into the Union. Instead, the treaty ensured that Texas would become part of the United States, that that Lone Star Republic would join the constellation of stars and stripes. Thank you so much. As some of you know, these uh, symposia don't automatically happen. Uh, uh, one of the things we've uh, gotten in the habit of doing every year is to get together uh, some of the speakers, some of the organizers, uh, on Saturday night after it's over to do a post-mortem and to start brainstorming for what we're going to do ahead. And as we brainstormed uh, this session, uh, we uh, were going over the boundaries and going over the speakers, and we probably ordered, changed our order of speakers three or four times, even in the last couple of months. And some of you who are most perspicacious may have noticed that this person sitting next to me is not Dr. Manuel Gonzalez Oropesa. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, uh, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Gonzalez Oropesa to come up to the uh, to come up to the front and uh, to have the option of going second as he's listed in the, uh, in the uh, program. Uh, or if he would prefer, uh, having sat here for the last hour thinking he was going third, uh, to actually go third. So, senor, uh, would you care to go second or third? I'd like to be first. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who couldn't hear, he'd like to be first. Uh, and so we're going to do the next best thing and give you your rightful place. I'm sorry. So let me, uh, let me uh, give you a, a too brief introduction. Uh, as professor of law at UNAM, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, uh, in Mexico City, uh, Professor Gonzalez Soropesa uh, has uh, become an expert in comparative law in constitutional law. Uh, he's going to talk to us today uh, about the boundaries between Texas and Mexico. Uh, those are plural, as he will, uh, as he will explain. Uh, uh, he is the author or editor of three dozen books and innumerable, literally innumerable articles. I couldn't keep up with how many. You law professors are very busy. Uh, uh, and, uh, and he has uh, consulted uh, in Europe with the European Union on issues of, 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 of law and justice. He has held endowed uh, and guest chairs at Quebec uh, in the United States, uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, look, I said it, didn't I? Uh, uh, that, that other place down the road from my institution at North Carolina State. Uh, uh, he, has, um, he has distinguished himself in his understanding of law and justice and the relationships between nations and, and with the issues of constitutional law and the rights and duties of, uh, of people who live under constitutions and who under those constitutions elect their leaders. He has been uh, a judge on the uh, board of, uh, uh, that supervises elections in Mexico for the last several years. And he comes to us with a rich knowledge of both law and reality. Uh, and sometimes those are not the same. Uh, and he will explain much of that to us. Please welcome Dr. Manuel Gonzalez Oropesa.
Howdy. <laughs> well, good morning. I'm, I'm delighted and honored to be here with you, and especially thank uh, to my friend, uh, Fran de la Teja, and of course, the San Jacinto Battleground Conservancy, who are making a, a great and wonderful work in the conservation of a historical uh, site, not just for Texas, but also for Mexico as well. Right. Uh, when I ask uh, an Austrian law professor about the Moctezuma headdress that they have in Vienna, and they say, uh, have you considered to return it to Mexico? And he bluntly said, no, <laughs> no. And say, why? Well, because uh, it's, the same, it's the same thing. This is also a piece for, for Austrian history, because it was a gift of the Emperor Moctezuma to the King Char uh, Charles uh, I or, or V of Spain and Austria. So it's a piece of history of Austrian history as well, not only for Mexico. I say, you are completely right. So the San Jacinto uh, uh, landmark is also a, a nice piece of history of Texas and Mexico. Of course, I prefer Alamo, but uh, <laughs> we are here. <laughs> Anyhow, I prefer uh, uh, to be here with you. And of course, uh, you're going to hear not the other side of the story, but the right side. <laughs> <laughs> the painful side. <laughs> painful for both countries. However, it's not my intention to uh, stress what you know, already know, the flaws or the mutual mistakes of the two countries, because uh, it's already known that. Uh, the only thing I have to blame is in San Jacinto, once that you have uh, signed the Treaty of Velasco, why did you kill Santana? <laughs> <laughs> it would be very good for Mexico as well. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting that some dictators that we have had, they have uh, died quietly at their bed. Santana, he died quietly in 1853. All of the heroes of the, our independence had died um, violently. Hidalgo, uh, Iturbide, Guerrero, many others, they died, executed. But Santana didn't die, <laughs> even though that he was the first, uh, I think, the choice to be executed by someone, either Americans, Mexicans, or whatever, right? And the same for Porfirio Diaz, the man who produced the Mexican Revolution. He died quietly in 1915 in Paris. And all the leaders of our revolution, they got executed. And they died violently. So this is my only complaint about that. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that uh, beyond the history that is fascinating, boundaries as uh, uh, James, I think that he stressed boundaries are fundamental to our countries, especially Mexico and the United States and Texas. Uh, they are fundamental because uh, boundaries should, uh, should attract foreign policies, special policies for two countries neighboring. Boundaries should be guaranteed by the national security that they are, and also boundaries are developing urban, seat, urban centers, urban uh, population. For instance, the boundary between Canada and the United States. Mostly Canada is in the boundary with the United States. All the cities, the most important cities, are in the boundary of, uh, between Canada and the United States. That doesn't happen with the United States with Mexico, but uh, certainly happens with Mexico in regard to the United States. They are uh, attracting the most developing cities that we have in the sense of attraction of human population are in the border line of the United States. So uh, I think that looking into the past of the formation of the Texas and Mexico boundary, uh, we can conclude that uh, there, there's a lesson of congruence and legal definition about what international boundaries between the two countries should be. First, I think, from that lesson, from the point of view of Mexico, 
No country should pretend that domestic law rule over the binational problems of a boundary. For instance, uh, in, back in 1830, we were the first country to impose immigration limits, to impose limits uh, on immigration passports. We tried to avoid this um, American flow of settlers, and uh, uh, General Manuel Mieriteran proposed, and it was accepted, on April 1830 to establish the first Mexican law imposing restrictions to immigration, which is an early stage of the immigration law history that we have. What, uh, what happened next? What all the immigration laws produce? Disobedience. <laughs> Lack of implementation. <laughs> we couldn't enforce of course, the immigration laws. And American flow began in the proportion, as mentioned by Professor, more than 30,000 people, American from, especially from Tennessee, and less than 3,000 Mexican nationals living in, that, uh, in this state. So uh, we, didn't, we probably we couldn't understand the meaning of colonization and immigration at the time. And we pretended to control it by our domestic law instead of other areas. But uh, the 1830s probably was too early for the development of international law in our two countries. Uh, second, treaties have to be fixed by international agreement not by unilateral decisions. Even though the wishes of empires of liberties are good, but nevertheless, they should have the consent of the other countries or the consent of other people. You have, uh, a, a, you have established a, a wise uh, jurisprudence, for instance, in dealing with uh, Indian people, indigenous people. You treat in Indian nations, in the words of John Marshall, like, like nations, exactly. And you sign treaties with them. Washington began signing treaties with the uh, Cherokee Nation and other nations, Aboriginal nations. And they have a special status in that. So boundaries are undeserved and a special status with treaties, not with unilateral decisions. In general, because this is not the point I'm going to, to talk. In general, I have uh, prepared uh, a, a small paper, which, by the way, uh, of course, uh, I have to confess that I'm not a historian. I'm a lawyer. Although I'm, I'm studying my graduate studies in history right now. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I prepared a paper that uh, is available for anyone who would like to to look, I'm going to leave my, my, car, my car here so I, I can distribute it. In that paper, I, can, I conclude that the Texas border with Mexico was a product, sorry, of violence, misunderstandings, and distortions. Violence not only from America, but from France, for instance. Uh, we have, uh, I have uh, uh, found a, new, uh, a newspaper uh, published in Spain uh, in 1813, uh, in the time that the Cortes of Cadiz, the first constitutional convention that we have, uh, and I say we have because uh, uh, people from New Spain represented New Spain before the Spanish courts of, of Cadiz in the same way and with the same uh, importance that the Spanish themselves so uh, in 1813, we have a news in, the, in Spain, a news, new, new Spain, of course, that uh, many French people were arrested in the area of uh, Nuevo Leon, right, in northern Mexico. So there were a lot of uh, adventurers from, uh, from La Salle expedition. Les de La Salle, who had been uh, commissioned to found uh, a town in the mouth of the Mississippi River, 
But he got confused. Well, it was 17th century. Uh, he ended up in another in a western side, southwestern side. He thought that he was in the Mississippi. And uh, right now, I think that we don't know where he was actually killed, Asal. We haven't found his body. And he was killed not by Indians, not by Spanish, but by his own uh, colleagues. So uh, there was violence there. There was violence from the empresarios, some of them, for instance. The empresario that you know as uh, with, with last name Edwards, who in 1826, 10 years before the Texas independence, proclaimed a Fredonian Republic, separated from uh, Texas, separated from Mexico and Coahuila and Texas, who was one state. So we don't see law-abiding citizens the, many of the empresarios. Stephen Austin was an example. As a, was, he was a good example because uh, you know that Mexico gave uh, these uh, lands not only with the title but also with the citizenship. Uh, when we say Americans in Texas, uh, we should say Mexicans in Texas because we, they were Mexicans according to the Mexican law. The citizenship was granted and that's why they could represents themselves. They were not foreigners for us. They could elect uh, mayors, they could elect authorities, because they were Mexicans, although their names were, their name was Edwards or Austin or whatever. So, uh, misunderstandings. One of the misunderstandings I would like to refer is precisely uh, the, the great misunderstanding of Thomas Jefferson regarding the uh, reach of the, of the border. Uh, because uh, he thought that Louisiana uh, stretched all the way to the Rio Bravo, or Grande, as it's called here. Rio del Norte has three names, this uh, river. And uh, Jefferson believed that uh, that was because the French had arrived to that position, to that river. The truth is, and I'm based on the Henri Joutel's uh, diaries, the truth is that, uh, of course, he didn't reach the Rio Grande, so south to the Rio Grande. And even Joutel himself, who was the personal secretary of La Salle, he just refers that in 1686, something like that, few men from La Salle's team have gone, he heard that they have gone so far as the Rio Grande. But you tell himself he couldn't identify these men. So there was a misunderstanding in that sense. And of course, the border was fixed as uh, the professor has said, from the Adams on his treaty in 1819. Okay, well, what's the vision of Mexico? The vision of Mexico is, uh, and I'm sorry to say it, there's, we don't talk about Texas independence. <laughs> we talk about Texas secession, <laughs> which is true, I think. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Texas was part of Coahuila, one of state. One of the big mistakes of Mexico was to put a huge state in land, but uh, not so much populated, e with a capital in the southern, most southern city of that region, which was Saltillo. So to go from San Antonio de Bejar to Saltillo would be almost impossible, like uh, going from, from uh, Texas to New Mexico, right, and on that way. So that was a complete mistake. As a matter of fact, uh, in the history of the state of Coahuila, which is the, the sister state to Texas, since the 1830s, the Coahuilans themselves, they thought that it was wise to separate or it was wise to move the capital of the state into a middle ground, for instance, San Antonio. And there's a, there was one governor who, in 1830s, 
uh, in one of these uh, fights uh, among different factions of, of politicians, he flew from Saltillo to the north in order to establish the capital of the state in San Antonio. But he got captured in the way, so he couldn't do it. So that was something that happened shortly before the Texas secession. Uh, and Texas has a good reason to secede from Mexico. It was not the only state. We have different states. For instance, the state of Zacatecas at the time. In 1835, when Santana promoted the abolition of the Constitution of 1824, many in Mexico, many people in Mexico thought that that was a kind of, uh, of uh, declining the social compact between the states and the federal government, and they declared themselves free from that compact. If the compact of the federal republic would be abolished in 1835, then all the states recovered the sovereignty. This was not the first time for the Spanish uh, uh, New World, because back in 1808, when Napoleon invaded Spain, and Napoleon captured the Spanish kings, what happened with the government of all the Spanish uh, dominion? Well, the people recovered sovereignty, and they th themselves declare, if not independent, at least sovereign. For instance, Father Miguel Hidalgo, the promoter of the initial movement of independence, he thought that uh, the people was sovereign, but he didn't claim that Mexico or New Spain would be Mexico as an independent country. He didn't believe that. He just believed that Napoleon should return to the Spanish king, and that's it. But after Hidalgo, the idea of autonomy or independence and the sovereignty of the people began to shape into the, into the way of independence, right? So when Texas protested against the uh, abolition of the Constitution of, Federal Constitution of 1824, it was not alone. Zacatecas, Yucatan, and other states in Mexico, they also claimed themselves independent. And in Mexico, we have a problem because we haven't defined the legal liaison between uh, states and the federal government. We haven't had a resolution like Texas versus White after the Civil War, in which the Supreme Court said the federal liaison, the federal link, is an eternal and perpetual link, and no state can just uh, secede by itself, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's something that happened here in Texas again. But uh, for instance, uh, uh, Canada is now struggling with Quebec in that sense. But since eight, eight, 1988 or something like that, the Supreme Court of Canada has also established something like the Texas versus White case in 1869. But uh, back in 1836, we didn't have that uh, development. And on the contrary, uh, we have accepted in Mexico secession under certain circumstances. For instance, in 1822, when Mexico got independent, we have uh, the annexation of Guatemala. But uh, Guatemala was not uh, really uh, comfortable with the Mexican empire, that they was the first uh, form of government that shaped. And therefore, they celebrated uh, a, a call, a plebiscitum, and uh, Filisola, the general Filisola, who has also some say to, uh, in the Texas history, Filisola was the general from the Mexican army to organize and to oversee the plebiscite celebrated in Guatemala that they said, no, we want to get separated from Mexico. And Mexico accepted that in that way in 1822. So I don't know what would happen if Texas would say so, because certainly uh, the plebiscite, a plebiscite in Texas would be, would be the same result, because most of the Texans were from American origin, and therefore they could vote, yes, let's get separated from that. 
But uh, let's go then, if you allow me to be short, to the main uh, part of uh, my presentation that is not in the paper, but uh, is inspired by the ideas and the thoughts that I have received from you. First of all, uh, the nature of that international agreements that we have had, the two countries. Uh, once that uh, Santana signed the uh, Velasco Treaty in 1836, we should do many things. First of all, to establish in our constitution that uh, war should not be conducted during the siesta time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't do that. <laughs> we didn't do that. So uh, what, what, did it, what we did, taking the lesson from the Treaty of Velasco in 1836, was that uh, in the new constitution that we have after uh, 1843, the constitutional basis that is called Bases de Administración, we establish that it would be forbidden for any president or head of state in Mexico to conduct himself the war, because it was completely insane what Santana did. He himself conducted the troops, right? Because he wanted to be the hero. He was living probably under an illusion of, uh, of, of uh, heroism and uh, charismatic leadership or some kind that he himself, as a president of Mexico, without asking uh, a leave of absence for, from the executive, to conduct the, the army. And then, of course, as any human, he deserves a nap. And therefore, well, that was his, his mistake. But in 1843, we forbade for Mexican presidents to be in charge directly of the uh, uh, troops. He didn't learn the lesson because in 1845, again, as, as, as uh, would be president, he conducted another, another uh, army, army uh, practice. Uh, at the time, uh, the Supreme Court listened one case, interesting case, the Isidro Reyes case, in which Isidro Reyes was uh, let's say, impeach, because uh, he was the defense uh, minister at the time, and he had signed the decree in which uh, allowing the commander in chief to conduct directly again in 1845 uh, other, other uh, practices of military nature. Uh, the Supreme Court decided uh, in Mexico that uh, he was not the real president because he, in this time, he has asked for uh, a leave of absence, uh, that there was another president, Valentin Canaliso, who was in charge of the executive. So he saved that. But then, uh, what happened next? The Texas secession, of course, helped for the next chapter, that, which is the American invasion in 1846 and 1847. Uh, the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1847 was uh, very interesting because it was signed by someone who, ha who didn't represent the United States because he didn't have the powers to sign it, <laughs> Nicolas Trist. And then uh, the federal government had signed it but there was a big problem under that because as I, as I will explain. The consequence of this treaty was that the treaty was challenged, not only in political terms, but also in legal terms, which is interesting. At the time, we have uh, correct the mistake made in the sense that we have abolished the centralist republic and we have reestablished the federal republic. Right exactly shortly before the American troops enter into Mexico City, Congress has approved to reestablish the Mexican Constitution of 1824, but with some reforms. 
One of the reforms, which is very interesting, uh, is a reform that James Madison would be delighted to know if he had uh, lived in that, uh, in that area. Because we adopted the nullification theory. <laughs> and we practice the nullification, and we try to practice the nullification precisely with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, right? Do you remember that the nullification was proposed by James Madison and, and Thomas Jefferson as well? And uh, under that uh, institution, the states had the power to uh, declare null and void any federal uh, legislation against the Constitution, right? And it, it sounds very well for, uh, for myself, the design, the constitutional design of the United States, being the, the states, the, the partners, let's say, of this union, they keep the, the power to declare whether that legislation is consistent with the Constitution, because all those powers delegated to the United States came from the states, right? From, to the federal government came from the states. So it was a very reasonable, but unfortunately, James Madison didn't have the, the success in the Philadelphia Convention, and instead you approve Article 4, uh, Article uh, 6, sorry, of your constitution, the supremacy clause. Well, uh, in 1847, we enacted the Reformation Act of the Constitution, precisely during the war between the United States and Mexico, and we established a curious institution that is called claim, in Spanish, reclamo, claim. In this claim, uh, we uh, established the same Madisonian model in the sense that federal Congress could overlook into the constitutionality of the state laws. And if Congress decides that that law is unconstitutional, Congress itself would declare it null and void. What we did was to complement, let's say, this Madisonian view and to put it more into federalist uh, perspective. And, and the Reformation Act established, oh, as well as the Federal Congress has this power, the state legislatures have this same power against federal laws. So when a federal law is considered unconstitutional, some three state legislatures or uh, fifth, uh, 10 representatives of the House, the Federal Congress, uh, or senators will have legitimacy, will have standing to, uh, let's say, to denounce that federal law as unconstitutional before the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court would not, would not decide the case. The Supreme Court just will turn it to the state legislature for the majority of the state legislature to take a decision on that. So it was a, an interesting two-way two nullification process, right? So when on February in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was approved by Congress in Mexico, in, on June of 1848, 11 federal representatives of Congress of Mexico uh, claimed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Right? And I don't know, uh, I'm sure that uh, the states would be mostly against the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo because one very peculiar reason. The fight between the United States and Mexico was not conducted by the Federal Army. The Federal Army was, of course, one permanent force vigilant of the Mexican territory. But the real fight was against the, these invasion forces of the United States with the National Guard of each state, the militia, the, mili the militia. And we took it from the United States. We established a state militia from the United States, and that militia has been the one who really fought against the United States. The, state, the, the country was too big, 
um, was too disorganized to conduct a war with the United States, uh, only relying on the Federal Army. So the war was conducted properly with the militia of Zacatecas, or Coahuila, or Nuevo Leon, and they were, or the Veracruz, when, when Scott uh, entered through the port, and uh, they were the real heroes in that war, not the, not the Federal Army. And therefore, they could really, as you know, the militia and the National Guard is, uh, is without limits, because they are all the citizens, male citizens. And uh, uh, even though Mexicans were very few in Texas, but in the central, central part of Mexico, we were a lot. right? So we could easily fight the American troops, despite the disadvantage of modernity in the weapons. In this, in this war, you already knew about the revolver, right? the automatic revolver. And we have 18th century uh, rifles. So it's not, uh, it was not uh, uh, a very uh, modern, up -to -date, up updated uh, army that we had. But nevertheless, the numbers of soldiers that we could have in every single state was enormous, was enormous. And I stress that not only to uh, foresee what would be the conclusion in the claim against the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, because most of the states who were conducting that war would, of course, vote against the treaty. And the treaty would be declared unconstitutional. There were grounds for being the unconstitutional. In, in the Mexican Constitution, no president has the power to accept secession of territory, not only purchase or acquire or, or sell territory, but not, not has the power to do it. So it would be unconstitutional in the first place. But politically, the states would be involved then, and then the, the, that treaty wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be signed or confirmed. I don't know what would happen. I don't know if, if the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, 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 was not signed. Probably I will be speaking uh, this, uh, this time in, in a better English than <laughs> that. But uh, I don't know what happened in that sense. But uh, the thing is that, for instance, uh, this interesting situation created by the treaty uh, forced Mexico to establish judicial review. Because the Mexican population was so tired of Santana and the dictatorship, as the Texans were, of course. And, and press, the, the printing newspapers, were the first one to fight against this decision of Santana to sign the treaty because it was insane. So the Federal Army was not the real conductor of the war, were the states. So uh, the states were betrayed by the federal troops in that sense. And the first uh, protection of human rights was precisely filed to the Supreme Court in 1847 and follow in 1848 against the decision of Santana of signing that treaty. And we began from that point on all the judicial review and the protection of human rights before federal courts. But uh, also it's a reflection for us uh, when uh, France invaded Mexico. Of course, let me say that we are quite disappointed because the two nations that we admire most, the United States and France, the two nations invaded Mexico. <laughs> so uh, the France uh, in, in invasion in 1861, while you, have, you were having the civil war, uh, produced a different result. Of course, the French took over the Mexican government, uh, but uh, in contrast, we, we, have had, we have got rid of, of Santana already. He had died in 1853. But instead, we had Benito Juarez, right? Benito Juarez. And he was like a Lincoln for us. And uh, Benito Juarez learned from the experience of the US-Mexico war. And he never 
he never signed any treaty with the French troops. Instead, he walked all the territory of Mexico. He reached even El Paso, right? El Paso del Norte. He lived in El Paso. Uh, he even went to New Orleans sometimes. But he never gave up in, because, precisely, the National Guards of each state would make a kind of guerrilla or guerrilla type of war against the French troops. And at the very end, the French troops didn't resist. And in 1867, we defeated the French and we reestablished the Republic. So this was a very interesting lesson from the uh, Treaty of International um, Treaty of, of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Two points, and I'm going to end, if you allow me. First is that the uh, Texas secession give us uh, some paradoxical lessons of, from the immigration standpoint. I have stressed already that the first immigration in this land was Mexican immigration law, and it was disobeyed. It was not uh, enforced, as, as uh, I hope, up to date. And, uh, uh, but the immigration problem that we have has one important thing for Mexico. With all the immigration and colonization <coughs> in Texas, we began the debate over the freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. Because the debate on slavery was already abolished. We abolished slavery in 1829, and the state of Coahuila, Texas, in the Constitution of 1827, they have abolished the, the slavery in the state of Coahuila, Texas. But federally, we have abolished the, the slavery in 1829. So that chapter was already closed. But the chapter that was opened was the freedom of religion. Vicente Rocafuerte was a very interesting person in Mexico. He was uh, Equatorian by origin. He was South American uh, by origin. He became ambassador from Mexico to Great Britain and other countries. And uh, he was an intellectual. Later, uh, after being in Mexico, he became president of Ecuador in 1830s. But uh, looking into the Texas uh, experience in Mexico, he wrote in 1831 an essay on the freedom of religion. That is, uh, in my opinion, one of the first uh, complete essays on freedom of religion in that sense. That chapter for you had been closed in the establishment of the colonies, of course, but not for Mexico, because uh, as, a, as a Spanish possession, we uh, uh, had the monopoly of the Catholic Church in the territory, right? And uh, the freedom of religion was not established up until 1873. So uh, the real fight, uh, the real fight with the United States was a slavery, I think, but the real fight with us was with the Catholic Church. And we couldn't overcome the Catholic Church until 1873. But uh, the Texas colonization began a very interesting debate among liberals and conservators. Uh, conservative. And uh, that debate was opened by uh, papers like the one written by Vicente Rocafuerte in 1831, and saying, we need colonization in the North. The need for immigration is clear ever since uh, 1812, in which the Cortes of Cadiz had stressed the point that the uh, new, the internal provinces of uh, East in New Spain needed more population. And the only way to populate these, these lands uh, would be with immigration. And Rocafuerta asked, how come are we going to attract immigration? Immigration from, from where? Immigration from the United States? Well. Of course, well, let's have it. And let's have it with freedom of religion, because they have their religion. This part of their, of their culture. We need to respect their culture. We cannot impose the Catholic religion upon them. 
or we uh, invite Germans or invite uh, Europeans, most of the Europeans would be uh, non-Catholics. Therefore, we need to open up the freedom of religion in our country, as Vicente Rocafuerte said. And finally, <laughs> what, uh, what the border should, uh, should bring. The border right now, even though in the past is not the best example, this border of law and order, right? Uh, should bring now in the present the rule of law. Uh, the regulation of the problems that we have all along the border should be solved by the rule of law, not by the rule of uh, rifles or rule of uh, vigilantes or rule of whatever, right? But the rule of law. And of course, we need to flexibilize, uh, to make flexible the rule of law concept that we have in the sense that not only international treaties should be signed for solving the problems in our common go border, but also to allow the states and the municipalities and the cities themselves, the border cities, to have the power to uh, reach agreements in the benefit of the both parties. Right now, of course, you might have more flexible system that we have, but in Mexico, international treaties are radical in the sense that only national government can sign these, these treaties. And the states and the cities, they are completely forbidden to participate into the resolution of their problems, even though they are border cities or bordering states. So the rule of law has to be enlarged and to have a new scope in the 21st century for the resolution of our, our border. Because I remember our border with Texas is the same. Of course, uh, in, the te in the Texas side, is the border is more paved. The ways are paved and clean and, and well painted and the border in Mexico. But they are the same geographically, naturally, it's a continuum. So the border divided artificially what is naturally the same landscape and the same society. Thank you. Uh, any questions you might have for Dr. Smith or Dr. Uh, Gonzalez Soropesa? about the issues they've raised uh, this morning, and I will try to repeat those questions so that they'll be uh, uh, heard by, by everyone. Um, are there any questions that you might have that have been raised by the uh, talks you've heard so far this morning? And I would suggest to you, you make up questions and we can make up answers. <laughs> yes, sir. The doctor referred to uh, the dispute between the U.S. and, the, and Mexico as being more uh, for religious freedom than uh, the other, but he did not mention the fact that uh, what I've heard is that there is, was a certain disagreement over taxation as well. Is, is that because the people tend to not have a complaint about taxation if they have their other freedoms? <laughs> uh, I'm not aware of the exact details of the taxation problem, but uh, the taxation at the time was a concurrent power. So uh, the taxes were enacted by the states, and very few taxes at the time by the federal government. So what I'm stress is that the freedom of religion concerned the federal government. Uh, and I'm talking uh, really about the uh, problems that uh, this uh, movement created at the state level. Uh, the, the question was about whether uh, uh, the contest between, or the conflict between Mexico and Texas dealt more, with, more with religion or more with uh, taxation. Uh, there was a, a, a 10 year uh, guaranteed uh, absence of tariffs, that is taxes on imports uh, into Texas uh, to the early Texan colonists who came from the United States. Uh, that came to an end in the early 1830s. And much of the conflict, violent and nonviolent, in Texas took place because of the resentment against the imposition of tariffs. Uh, 
the uh, issue of nullification was raised earlier. Uh, and of course, that issue in the United States uh, reverberates around South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina believed in the, in the early 1830s that its uh, economy was being heavily damaged by the high tariffs that were being charged by the United States on imports, which cut down on South Carolina's ability to export its crops. And so uh, a, a genuine constitutional crisis took place in the United States uh, with regard to South Carolina's effort to nullify a federal law. Uh, I'm very uh, 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 entranced by the idea of mutual nullification that Dr. Gonzalez Oropesa mentioned, in which states could nullify federal actions and, and, and the federal government might be able to nullify state actions. That reminds me a little bit of the Polish parliament, uh, <laughs> which could only operate if there were no objections, uh, which meant that they sat on their hands a lot. Uh, because if any single member objected, now did this mutual ability to nullify create any kind of paralysis in Mexico uh, as one tries to nullify the other and vice versa? Well, uh, now I understand your question, right, in the sense that, uh, yes, the taxation was a problem, uh, but uh, we don't see that that was the main problem with the, with the uh, empresarios, right? Uh, other problems were higher, like uh, slavery or like the land speculation and other. But uh, for instance, taxation has produced some problems in other states. Uh, it's traditional, this, the problem the, that the tariffs created with the Yucatan Peninsula because of the position of the Yucatan Peninsula closer to British colonies, and etc. They claim that the tariffs imposed by Mexico were uh, unfair and therefore uh, uh, they have seceded as well. Uh, Yucatan uh, uh, was uh, also declared its sovereignty and separated from Mexico from 1841 to 1843. And uh, finally uh, uh, Yucatan became again part of Mexico. But uh, that was the extreme in, in Yucatan case, and I don't see that, uh, uh, that uh, situation in Texas. But uh, I might be wrong. Just uh, one more, sorry, sorry, go ahead. And regarding, regarding your question, uh, very interesting question. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a little bit uh, strange, but uh, uh, we have a civil law tradition, and in the civil law tradition, at the time, mostly, not now, but at the time, no court of law could uh, unmake what the lawmaker make, made, right? So no court of law could really uh, avoid uh, the application and enforcement of the laws. So the only uh, body capable of doing that is not, is that clear? Oh. Hey, you can just a little closer. Oh, I'm sorry. So. Uh, the only body the, capable of uh, deciding the constitutional issue were the legislative bodies. And for the legislative bodies, the Constitution said, the Congress is the only capable to uh, interpret and uh, decide about the, the doubts of the Constitution. Uh, and that's why the Federal Congress could nullify the state laws. But the other, other way around, which is the complement to Madison, I would say, is that the uh, le state legislatures in our system are the ones who approve, as a complementary body, the constitutional reforms. We don't have a system of amendments. We have a, a system of constitutional reforms approved by federal Congress and the majority of state legislatures. So uh, state legislatures are part of this constitutional power and therefore, if uh, federal laws uh, should be enforced by the state authorities, it's clear that the state legislatures should have a say and a decision about the constitutionality of federal laws. The only problem created was that, uh, I'm sorry, I still no hearing? Uh, the only problem was that uh, the International uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that was the only problem I'm, I'm aware of. 
And uh, that was not a real problem in the sense that the Supreme Court got a solution for that. <laughs> uh, he was not to decide the case, but he was the one who uh, conduct, let's say, the procedure before the state legislatures. And the resolution of the Supreme Court was that uh, the Constitution says that this procedure su should uh, uh, go for laws according to the legislative procedure. And since the treaty is not a law in that sense, because it's an international law that doesn't go to both, uh, both chambers of, of the Congress, therefore, this is not the law or the kind of law that could be claimed before this procedure. So that was the solution. Gene, did you want to add anything? No. Uh, <laughs> One, one thing uh, that I, I might mention, uh, the professor was exactly right in citing Madison and Jefferson in disagreeing with the concept of judicial review, specifically the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions of 1798 and 1799. This had to do with the Sedition Act as much as anything else, which made it a crime punishable by imprisonment to criticize the president or the Congress. Uh, and one might ask, well, what about the First Amendment? Uh, wouldn't the courts come in and enforce uh, the, the, the freedom of, of speech granted in the First Amendment? Well, Jefferson and Madison did not want to give the United States Supreme Court the right to decide what the United States could do. They wanted to uh, leave that in the hands of uh, of the states. And so they raised the issue of nullification and by implication secession. Uh, their, their claim was that the states could nullify the action of a federal law uh, which they believed was unconstitutional within their states. This all became uh, uh, a, 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 a null point uh, in 181 when Jefferson was uh, inaugurated and they allowed the Sedition Act to pass. However, uh, that Federalist President Adams uh, whose administration was responsible for the Sedition Act, got one of those midnight judges into office in 1801, after uh, they had been defeated, but the Federalists uh, still controlled the Congress for a while, and they got John Marshall into the Supreme Court as the Chief Justice. And what Marshall was able to do with a uh, sleight of hand, I would call it judicial jujitsu, uh, by claiming not to have jurisdiction in the case of Marbury versus Madison. He said, I just don't have any power in this case because Congress gave me original jurisdiction, but the Constitution only gives me appellate jurisdiction, so I just can't, I just can't uh, take any power in this case. As I tell my students, as I scream and jump up and down to emphasize the point, I'll not do that today, is that he had just declared a law passed by Congress unconstitutional. So I don't have any power except for that. Uh, and so that, that issue of judicial review, by the way, is still controversial. There's been a case in the last month in which some state legislators have claimed that the right of judicial review is not in the Constitution and that the 10th Amendment reserves such powers for the states. So depending on your political point of view, that issue of of national supremacy and judicial review that John Marshall asserted in Marbury versus Madison is still contentious in the United States, uh, to the amazement of some. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. In the back. Uh, just raise up and yell out. <laughs> Well, I 
think what well, you've excuse got me, to... Excuse me, Gene. Very, very briefly, so that those hearing this on recording can understand the question, it has to do with uh, John Quincy Adams' long time later opposition to the annexation of Texas, uh, probably due to the slavery question as much as anything else. But um, an early, perhaps, advocate of expansion uh, who later became an, uh, an opponent of uh, annexation of Texas. Dr. Well, Smith. And, and you have to keep in mind that here's a, here's a guy who had spent his entire life uh, on, the, on the public payroll. He had spent time as the U.S. minister to Russia. He understood the, the mechanisms and diplomatic wranglings of how you create an empire. Now, as he is serving as Monroe's Secretary of State, and historians generally attribute him to be perhaps the best Secretary of State that we've ever had, he is envisioning a, a continental nation. And even though Lewis and Clark had made that trek out to the west and had stepped upon the shores of the Pacific, you know, there were still overlapping claims with the British, and the Russians were making a play for, uh, for the Northwest. And here is an opportunity for him once and for all to get it solidified in treaty that the United States is a continental nation. So his, his decision to omit Texas has really less to do with his interest in Texas at the time than it has to do with his interest in becoming a continental nation. Now, what happens in subsequent you know, when he's serving in Congress and his, his later career is that, yes, he is opposed to the annexation of Texas, and it's raised on the issue of slavery. He becomes a vehement opponent of the slavery question. Um, one of the things, of course, that the adams on East Treaty did was to put a Spanish boundary uh, in the way of American expansion. And I think Professor Smith is exactly right in that the United States did not take that seriously. Uh, why? In 1795, there was a Spanish boundary that kept the United States out of Natchez, now in Mississippi. It fell. In 1803, there was an ostensible Spanish boundary, now undermined by a secret treaty with Napoleon that was supposed to keep the United States out of New Orleans and the Louisiana Purchase. It fell. As Dr. Smith explained, there was a Spanish boundary that was supposed to keep the United States out of Baton Rouge and East, West Florida. It fell. In 1813, uh, we were at war with the United Kingdom, or with, with Great Britain. Uh, what did we take in the War of 1812? Mobile Bay, uh, where a Spanish boundary was supposed to keep the That's United right. States out. In 18, uh, up until 1819, there was a Spanish boundary that was supposed to keep the United States out of East Florida. Andrew Jackson crossed the boundary, hung British agents, burned down things, and the, uh, the Spanish government was told, I guess, by John Quincy Adams, that um, if you don't sign uh, away Florida, we might let Jackson loose again. Uh, that was the implied uh, uh, threat. And so here you've got five Spanish boundaries in a row, which between 1795 and 1819 have each fallen uh, year after year after year. And so I think that Pro uh, Professor Smith is probably exactly right, that the Sabine River did not seem to be an impenetrable boundary. It was certainly uh, not too deep to cross. Uh, uh, no, and, and as, as, as my students in North Carolina don't understand, but most people here do, East Texas is a physical extension of the Old South, geographically, topographically, in terms of its yeah. climate and geography, crops, et cetera. It's a tough road to hoe, as the De La Pena diary will tell you, between Corpus Christi and Matamoros. Uh, there is a physical boundary, a physical barrier, if you will, uh, between what is now Mexico proper and uh, East Texas where those Anglos were coming in. It was so much easier for them to come across the border than it was for Mexico either to get settlers or even its own army uh, to those exactly. boundaries. Uh, I saw another question here. We have time for one more. Uh, I'm not sure how the ex-governor of Tennessee established the Rio Grande as a border for Texas, but from the Mexican standpoint, does the Rio Grande have any boundary significance in Mexico historically? 
The question is about the historical significance of the Rio Bravo or the Rio Grande uh, as a boundary in Mexico. Dr. Oropesa. Prior to the revolution. Uh, certainly, prior to the revolution. Right. Uh, it's, not, it's not exactly uh, 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 an obstacle. It's not exactly an obstacle, although at the time probably it could be a, 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 big, a big river. But inside Mexico, we have uh, the Rio Balsas or the Rio Sumacinta, who are as big and as strong as the Rio Grande, and they are not barriers for the southern part of central part of, of Mexico. So it's not, uh, it's not exactly. And uh, the Spanish uh, exploration, I think that the first Spanish exploration of the coast of, the, of Texas was in 1648, something like that. Uh, you are the experts in that. But uh, Spanish explorers, oh no, I, I'm sorry, I think that it was at the end of the 15th, uh, 16th century. Uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish explorers have, the Spanish are very, very interesting people <laughs> in the sense that they, they were all over the world at the time, right? And there was no uh, physical difficulties to stop them in, the, in that sense. And uh, the frontier man in, in Mexico, they have almost the same, the same uh, trend, the same vocation. Uh, uh, I think that there's one river, the Medina River, I think, that was fixed as a, as a probable uh, border between Texas and, and the rest. Uh, uh, but the Nacogdoches River as well, uh, I don't know how. The, the Medina was the boundary between Coahuila Italian. Coahuila and Texas, but, well, right. Coahuila and Texas. Right. but the traditional southern boundary of Texas along the Gulf of Mexico had been the Nueces, uh, where Corpus Christi uh, is, uh, is today. Um, but that's but, exactly, Coahuila was part of Mexico, right? And so. uh, the province of Nuevo Santander, which became the Mexican state of Tamaulipas, crossed the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande was an artery. The Rio Grande was the heart of a community. Uh, and that community was split in half uh, by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which established that Rio Grande boundary of Texas. You got to remember, and I, I, my, my apologies to uh, all those people who love that image of Texas shooting up all the way to Wyoming uh, and incorporating the eastern half of Mexico. That's one of those aspirational boundaries that I mentioned before. It's not a boundary in reality. Uh, Texas couldn't even control Laredo, uh, much less Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Uh, the only thing that made the Rio Grande the actual boundary of Texas, even where it is today, is the power of the United States Army. Uh, not of Texas, uh, but of the United States Army and the United States government. Uh, if you accept the Rio Grande as the legitimate boundary of Texas, then you believe that Santa Fe is just a county seat in Texas. That's what the, that's what the Texans claimed. It was established as the capital of New Mexico in 1610 and has been the capital of New Mexico ever since. Uh, and the Texans couldn't control it. The Texans claimed it. Look, the Texas Congress in the second Houston administration, frustrated because they had been invaded a couple of times by Mexico, who captured San Antonio twice in 1842, uh, frustrated because the unemployment was high, the bank, the treasury had been bankrupted by Lamar, passed a law annexing everything between Texas and the Pacific Ocean. And it was only Sam Houston's veto that kept that boundary from being all the way to Santa Barbara. And you'd have to wear a bigger T-shirt, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of unreality uh, that is sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, seen by those who look at those Texas uh, boundaries. Uh, Stephen Hardin, the great historian of the Texas Revolution, had in his living room in Victoria a, a great big map of the Republic of Texas with its extension up uh, into Wyoming. And, uh, and I, I said, Steve, you know, the, of course, Mexican law wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have approved of that. They had a different notion of where the boundary was, whether you want to call it the Nueces or the Sabine. Uh, and I said, do you really believe that might makes right? 
Uh, I was, I really knew how to get at him this way. Do you really believe that might makes right and, and the Texan claim uh, justifies that map? And he says, yes, absolutely, might makes right. And I said, well, in that case, this map is bogus because look what happened to the Santa Fe expedition in 1841. Mexican might captured those people and stuck them in prison when they were lost and tired and sick and couldn't get to Santa Fe on their own. Uh, so uh, the might of the Texas Republic is highly exaggerated. Uh, it was a one-horse republic that was on its last legs. Sam Houston was desperate to get it annexed by the United States. He was trying to play the United States and the British off against each other so that the slavery question would be forgotten by all those Whigs and Democrats in the Congress who were so scared to death of the slavery issue. Uh, but uh, the boundaries of the Texas Republic, the actual boundaries of the Texas Republic, were established more than, by, by one group more than anyone else. Uh, and Cynthia Ann Parker was very much aware uh, that the Comanches uh, were the most powerful barrier in the 1830s uh, to, the, to the Western uh, expansion of Texas. And the Comanches were riding into Mexico and causing havoc uh, at the same time. Much of the reason that the United States found it relatively easy to invade North Mexico in 1846 is because they had been pounded for more than a decade by the raids of the Comanches. I would uh, recommend to you Brian DeLay's book, The War of a Thousand Deserts, uh, which makes uh, exactly that point. Um, I, I don't, they've turned on the lights. Uh, they're going to get a hook to pull me off the stage. Uh, I'm going to declare it uh, lunchtime, and we will gather here again in two hours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.